afternoon and welcome to Deschutes Public Library's online programming. Today, I'd like to welcome Scott Hewler. He's the author of seven books of nonfiction and he's written on everything from the death penalty to bikini waxing, from NASCAR racing to the stealth bomber for such newspapers as the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and the Los Angeles Times, and such magazines as Backpacker, Fortune, and ESPN. His books have been translated into five languages. He currently works as a senior writer at Duke Magazine and lives in Raleigh, North Carolina with his wife, the writer June Spence, and their two sons. Uh, you can find Scott's full bio on our website, um, more information there about him. Um, Scott, I forgot to ask you before we started, do you want to answer questions as they come up or you want to save them all till the end? Um, well, uh, why don't, if, if questions come up, why don't we just go after them? Here's what I like to tell people. Um, I'm very interesting and I'm very fascinating <laughs> and I'm sure you will all be able to listen to me for hours at a time. But the secret is, I've heard it all before, and I would much rather answer questions because that's more interesting to me, and I think we can agree that the important thing is for me to be happy, so. Great, okay, well, I'm gonna invite you to share your screen. I'm so glad this, your book, like we were talking earlier, your book has meant a lot to me, and so I'm, I'm happy that you're here to share it with others. So let's go ahead and get started. I will do that, that sounds great. Hi, um, this is a story of kind of, an insane trip that I took. And uh, that's really one of the great uh, journeys of my life. I, I don't think I'm the only person who organizes my life according to the great big trips I've taken, whether they're uh, standard American style family trips from, uh, from the East Coast to the West Coast and back in a, you know, dragging a little camping trailer or uh, backpacking around Europe or up and down the Appalachian Trail or all the different things that we do as people, we take journeys. And this was one of my best journeys. And uh, of course it was, because it's the foundational journey of our uh, literature as Western people. It's the, the foundational story of Western literature in a lot of ways is this journey. Now, I didn't get to it just because of Odysseus. Um, I got to it because of this book, uh, Ulysses by James Joyce. We've all heard of this book. It's meant to be the greatest book in, in the English language. The, it's on every list of the greatest novels of the 20th century, usually as number one. Um, uh, what happened to me was people were always handing me Ulysses and I would say, you know, you have to read it. You're a writer, you're an English major, you have to read Ulysses. And I would start to read it and, you know, stately plump book mulligan. And then I'm done. It was just crazy. I was like, I can't hang with this. So I read something and I found out that Joyce uh, published Ulysses when he was 40 years old. And I discovered this and I was like 40 one. And, you know, I was like, when you give me Ulysses, I feel the way everybody feels when they see Ulysses. They, it's like, yeah, I can't do it. So I was working for an NPR member station at that point in my life. And so I did what you do. I wrote uh, a piece for uh, All Things Considered, uh, making fun of people who read Ulysses. And as we know, Ulysses ends with this famous Joycean sentence that goes on for pages and pages and pages and ends with, yes, I said, yes, I will. Yes, that's the famous a sort of great uh, affirmation that ends Ulysses. And uh, I ended my little piece saying, no, I'll say, no, I won't know the next time somebody hands me uh, Ulysses and says, you should start reading it. So I said, I will not do it. So what happens? Well, naturally what happens is uh, people in Nashville where I lived at the time said, hey, uh, we're talking about it. And one guy said, I heard this guy on radio say, you can't read Ulysses. That's totally true. I've tried it. The guy he was talking to who was managing a bookstore said, oh, no, that's not correct. I have read Ulysses. In fact, I did my uh, senior thesis on it at Wesleyan, and you just need someone to teach you how to read Ulysses. And so the guy who was complaining said, and the guy running the bookstore said, okay, I'll do it. And they started a book club, and they called me up, and they said, won't you join our book club. And I said, I was just on national radio saying I would never read this book. Of course, I will join your book club. I found that a pleasing irony. And so we read Ulysses, which I thought was 
actually, once there was somebody holding my hand and leading me through, uh, it was pretty great. And uh, I enjoyed it. I wouldn't read it a second time, but I was glad I did it. It was something I could check off my list of things to do. Now, here's what happened. Uh, I, for my entire adult life, have walked around talking about uh, Odysseus as being my sort of my my model, the model person. I'd like to be like Odysseus. I try to make my life, base my life on his, uh, you know, Odysseus, uh, his patron goddess is Athena. And so I try to live my life in a way that would please Athena. And I talk, and if you had ever met me in my twenties at a party, you would have hated me. And I would have bent your ear about this. And so my wife, uh, she was my girlfriend then, uh, was at a, uh, at a, you know, jumble sale or a, or a flea market. And she saw a copy of uh, Ulysses, of, of the Odyssey, the original Odyssey. And she bought it for me and brought it back home. And she says, well, you know, since you're reading Ulysses, you should probably go back to the Odyssey. And I was like, yes, yes, yes. And I put it on the side of my night table and I ignored it because I am a dumbass. And um, then at some point I picked up the Odyssey and uh, for one thing, it turned out that the Odyssey was actually specifically written for me and people exactly like me. Here's the story. The first thing I found out was that I was talking a line of crap. I had never actually read the Odyssey. When ninth grade came around and we read the Odyssey, I, you know, skimmed a few chapters and took a couple, cheated on a couple quizzes probably, and checked it off my list of things to do. So here's when I read in bookstores or talk about this, I always tell people to guess um, how many, uh, the Odyssey is a book of uh, 24 books, what we would call chapters, and uh, how many of them involve these famous trip of Odysseus with Cyclops and the Scylla and Charybdis and Sirens and all this kind of stuff. How many of those books? It turns out four of them, four of them have to do with all this great travel that we talk about. Fully half of the Odyssey takes place after Odysseus has returned to Ithaca. And as I was reading this, I was stunned by this. And this book is written for middle-aged men like me. As I said, I was in my 40s at the time. And the book it starts out where you're dealing with, you know, Odysseus has been gone for 20 years. So he starts out as a person in his 20s going off to war and comes home 20 years later. He's a person in his 40s and he's dealing with all the complicated problems that people in their 40s deal with. Kids who are growing up and either growing up too fast or not growing up fast enough. Complexities in the relationship with their spouse. Odysseus is dragged halfway across the world to get into a war of uh conquest based on a big lie like that could ever happen, right? As Americans, we've never seen anything like that. But at any rate, all of this stuff is going on. So he has, it's like he deals with a terrible boss. Plus it takes him 20 years to get home. Talk about an awful commute. Odysseus is living the same life we are living. And as I read this book, just the notion of a journey really powerfully, profoundly resonated with me. And, uh, as a reporter for a radio station, I had uh, recently interviewed the guy who had written Walking the Bible. And I thought, hey, wait a minute. Maybe that's what I ought to do the same thing for the Odyssey that this guy did for the Bible. Well, turned out people thought that was a good idea. So I got to go on a trip. So here is the list of the of the, the 14 sort of stations. Um, one is Troy, where it starts. 14 is Ithaca, where it ends uh, Odysseus's journey. But all of the other places are places all throughout the Mediterranean. And the funny thing is, of course, um, let's go where Odysseus went. Well, you know, I know, everybody knows the Odyssey is a work of fiction, it's made up. And when you start talking about this, you very quickly get into this incredible, wonderful argument that people have been having for literally almost 3000 years. And on the one hand, you have the people who are like, well, Odysseus was probably a real person, but if he wasn't a real person, certainly the Trojan War was a real place. And, um, 
we can think about the, the places that were described as though they were based on real places. And it's interesting to go looking around the Mediterranean and see where the ancient Greeks would have known and the poet Homer, if there was such a thing, blah, blah, blah. That's one side. The other side is like, are you crazy? This is a made up story. It's like saying you're going to go and find the original place where Alice in Wonderland met the Mad Hatter. That's crazy. It's like saying you're going to go to Candace and find out where Dorothy, you know, where the tornado picked Dorothy up and where Oz had to be. It's just crazy pants. And so that's really fun. But the nice thing is, because people have been talking about this and arguing about it for almost 3,000 years, there are a lot of sources that have discussed different places. And um, so I was able to spend a lot of time with a lot of these ancient sources and some modern ones and make what made the most sense to me as a journey and also not insignificantly could be turned into ticketable 21st century destinations because I had to get there. I didn't have 20 years to do it. Funny thing that happened was about five minutes after I got uh, the contract to write this book and I was thinking, oh gosh, where will I go? And how should I decide? And what should I do? And time was sort of spreading out. Um, my wife walked in to the, uh, to the bedroom where I was sitting holding a, a, a towel and in her hand was a little pen shaped object with little red lines on it. And she was like, do these lines look red to you? And so suddenly we were about to have a baby. So I had to travel real fast and get home in time. So that in some ways that was very satisfying. Homer uh, describes Odysseus uh, leaving home when his infant son is just born and coming home when he's 20, heartbroken to have missed his entire life. I found it, I found a nice resonance there that I was leaving home when uh, I suddenly had a, a child on the way, which I didn't know whether it was going to be a son or not. It turned out to be a son, but I was uh, thrilled about that. So at any rate, I organized this trip, uh, kissed my wife goodbye, and uh, headed out, starting in, of course, Troy. Um, and the interesting thing is there were some basic principles that I, uh, that I used to organize my travel. If there was a place that we knew was the exact place, I went to that place. I didn't just decide it would be more interesting to pretend that Troy might have been in China or something like that. I went where we knew that it was. If there was profound agreement, I went there. And the other thing was I traveled the way Odysseus traveled, which is... I just showed up and then when I got to a place, I had to figure out where to stay and what to eat and all that kind of stuff, which is a way I kind of like to travel anyway, but it's important to think about that because one of the things about the Odyssey is that it is a travel book. Um, I had a, a, a thing that I would scroll on the margins of my books that I would call travel true, that when... Uh, Homer describes something that's really important to just, not just the story of Odysseus, but just what it's like to be a person out there in space. That's, uh, I would write travel true because it was so important. But at any rate, Troy, let's start in Troy. As you know, uh, researchers believe there actually was a Trojan War. Um, they're not sure uh, what the war was about, whether it was about a pretty girl, we don't know. Um, it seems much more likely that it was a war of conquest. That's what most wars are about. Um, and uh, a guy named Heinrich Schliemann found the actual Troy on the Dardanelles, just where Homer describes it. And uh, so you can go there now. And there's a, there's a big uh, horse there that you can climb in. And that's a picture of me uh, leaning out of that horse. And if you read the like Lonely Planet books about travel in that region in the Mediterranean. They make fun of Troy. They uh, People call Tr Troy a ruin of a ruin because it's so old and it's been sort of, it was mishandled by Schliemann and, and it has suffered a lot. Uh, and it was rebuilt over and over and over again using pieces of the old Troy because people do that. And so it's very complicated. But the uh, the Lonely Planet books will make fun of the 
wooden horse. And you're like, why would you climb into that? And my take on it is, why on earth would you not? If you're going to Troy, isn't the wooden horse fundamentally wired there? Isn't that, you want to see the walls, you want to feel the wind, and you want to see the wooden horse. I found Troy a thrilling place to be, and I loved it. And uh, I climbed up the wooden horse. And uh, when we get back to showing you uh, me, I'll show you I have a little wooden horse that I bought in Troy as, as something that I have. So then the, the next step um, that Odysseus takes is he goes to uh, uh, the, the shore of what is now Greece. And they, uh, Homer describes Odysseus and his, his fleet uh, beaching uh, on the land of the, the Cyconies. And um, the interesting thing is we see Odysseus right off the bat doing a terrible job. Odysseus, you know, whoops the locals. Uh, they take some of their sheep. They take some of their people and they're like, okay, let's go. Odysseus is like, let's go, you guys, let's get out of here. And the men are like, no, come on. We just, we just had a, another great victory. We're the, we're the, the championship Greek army. We can beat anybody. Let's sleep on the beach here and have ourselves a party. And Odysseus is like, well, I don't think so. But he gives up. He kind of shrugs, says, screw it. Let's just lay down on the beach. And of course, in the morning, uh, the Cyconies who were left alive have had a chance to beat the bushes and bring some more people. And they come riding in uh, down to the beach and they kick the crap out of the beat out of the Greeks and they they lose an entire uh, ship ship's worth of of soldiers and uh, of spoils and uh, it's a uh, it's a to me it's a great example of how you uh, uh, when you win your championship the first thing you do is get overconfident and start reading your own press clips. Now, where you go there on the, the shore of the Mediterranean in Eastern Greece, you have these beautiful tiny little beaches that you can get to. And I sat on that beach for just hours and I was the only person there. And I, it was such a great experience to feel like, okay, I'm kind of getting my way into, into this, this experience of, uh, being Odysseus, and uh, it was, uh, it's a ridiculous thing to be doing, but I enjoyed it, and it was fun to be there. So that's the Cyconies. Next thing to do is, uh, the next place you, you go after that, um, Odysseus uh, is in, uh, there's a terrible windstorm, and uh, scholars look at the windstorm after the, the defeat of the Cyconies as being an indication that you're leaving the real world behind. You're no longer part of the uh, actual geography. You're in this, this make-believe geography. And this is the first place that Odysseus goes to that, um, that something crazy happens. He, uh, they end up on the land of the Lotus Eaters. And it's one of the most famous episodes in the Odyssey, and yet it is actually, I think it's about nine lines long. It's an extremely short episode. Everybody, everybody from ancient days until now agree for some reason that the, uh, that the Isle of Jerba in Tunisia is, uh, is where the Lotus Eaters were. So I went to Jerba and, uh, it's a beautiful island. If you have never traveled, it was my first time in Africa. It's uh, if you're traveling in a, a, a Muslim country for, for Americans, for Westerners, is a truly thrilling experience because you hear five times a day the call to prayer just broadcast everywhere. And it is absolutely mesmerizing and magical. I can't strongly enough recommend that you do that. Um, in any case, the, the story that Odysseus tells is that um, his men go off to see where are we, what's going on, where have we landed, 
and they don't come back and he has to go get them and they're they're partaking of the lotus they're eating the lotus which makes them forget everything and not want to go anywhere or do anything and odysseus kind of grabs him by the ear and says come on you knuckleheads let's go back and he throws him in the boat and off they go it's uh there's nothing terribly dangerous that happens it is uh odysseus is smart and doesn't eat the lotus himself but it's a pretty small thing uh Jerba is just a beautiful island, although I liked uh, Tunis even more, really, spending a lot of time in Tunis. But one of the things that, uh, that I loved about uh, the visit to Jerba was that I ended up staying at a resort there. And I'm sitting for days and days at this resort where all you're doing is eating and drinking and staring at the ocean. And I was just like, I'm with Odysseus. This is boring. This is not what I want. And as I put in the book, you would not think uh, that uh, a middle-aged man could sit around a pool in a resort watching young women topless rubbing suntan oil on, on themselves and get bored by that. But I actually did. I was like, I need to be moving again. So um, off I went uh, and uh, to stop four which is where uh, Odysseus meets one of his most famous foes, who is the Cyclops. Now, people have placed the Cyclops all over the Mediterranean, but most people seem to agree that it's uh, on Sicily. And at the western tip of Sicily, there are actually enormous caves. And in fact, uh, the cave that I went visiting I didn't find this myself. I read the literature and I found this is on Via Ciclope on the on Cyclops Street. And the street next door is Polyphemus Street, which is of course the name of the Cyclops. So they figured it out there that they have a little thing to sell. It's not much of a tourist attraction, but I went and I really liked it. Now um and in fact when I got there it was full of like goat shit. Because somebody clearly, if you can look at the at the picture, you can see that somebody uses it to pen up goats and sheep up there, which is exactly what Odysseus finds. And I found that thrilling. Um, what I loved is, if you're familiar with the story, um, Odysseus, the famous story of the Cyclops, Odysseus calls himself no man. When, Odysseus, when the Cyclops says, who are you? Odysseus says, I'm no man. I'm no man. And so when Odysseus when the Cyclops captures the men and he's eating them one after another. And then Odysseus gets him drunk with wine he got from the Cyclones and then uh, pokes his eye out and the Cyclops starts screaming. The other Cyclopses on the island are like, what's happening to you? And the Cyclops says, no man is killing me. And they're like, well, if nobody's killing you, then it's between you and the gods and we got nothing to be involved in it. So it's very clever. And uh, it turns out that the, the sneaky little guy beating the giant and the no man story are two of the most common uh, myths in human history. They show up wherever people are, those myths show up. They grow wild like the dandelions. Everywhere there are people, we tell ourselves story about being a small creature in a great big world and using our wits to get by. So that's, that's fun facts to know and tell. Anyway, um, after the Cyclops cave, Odysseus goes uh, to the island of the Wind King, of Aeolus the Wind King. Um, there are a series of islands north of Sicily called the Aeolian Islands, and there's lots of other choices where people want to put the Wind King, but I was like, if you have an island called, a series of islands called the Aeolian Islands, I'm just going to take that as the place to go. And there are these beautiful series of, of islands just north of Sicily. If you've never traveled in the Mediterranean in the summer, you cannot possibly understand what it is like trying to get a ferry from Messina to the, uh, to the Aeolian Islands. It is a thing of madness and mayhem. And uh, when it was time to choose which island to go to, I just said, where's the first boat leaving this madness? And they said, uh, the, uh, you know, right up north. And so I left for the island of Volcano. That was the first one. And uh, 
that was going to be good enough for me. It was part of the Aeolian Islands. And it turned out that there was a statue of Aeolus himself on the island of Volcano. So I was very lucky and I enjoyed that. Now, also on Volcano, as you can imagine, there is a, uh, a dead volcano there. And there are, are hot springs and uh, places where you can sit in the uh, in the ocean, right at the beach, and there's hot hot air bubbling up through. You can sit in the bubbles. It's an amazing place. Black sand beaches because of the uh, the magma that has turned into sand, and it's a beautiful thing. Um, now, uh, I when I traveled there and I walked up there, and they said only do it first thing in the morning because if if you go up there late in the day, it's hot and you may faint. And I got up there and it was plenty hot while I was up there, but the hissing of the air coming out of the fumarole, I uh, put a microphone, I dangled a little microphone down there as a radio person, I always have a mic on me, and it melted the microphone. So uh, I was glad I didn't lean down to listen, but it melted the microphone. So that was kind of fun. Anyway, um, that was the island of the Wind King. Uh, the, the story of Odysseus there is he sits with the Wind King for a month feasting and enjoying himself, asks for help. The wind king says, I'm going to put all of the winds in a bag, except for the west wind. The west wind will push you home to uh, Ithaca. Enjoy yourself. For nine days, they uh, they paddle their way home. Odysseus, again, demonstrating terrible leadership, says, I will stay awake the whole time. I'm going to guide the ship. I'm going to manage it. And finally, within sight of Ithaca, he describes they can see the fires of the farmers, of, you know, who live on Ithaca in the hills. Um, he's overcome by exhaustion. He falls asleep. His men, uh, looking at the, uh, looking at this bag underneath the, the, the chair from which he's managing the boat, think, oh, that's treasure. He's keeping that treasure from us. So they open up the bag of the winds. You know what happens. They're blown right back to uh, the island of Aeolus, and uh, Odysseus has to say, I'm sorry, back again. <laughs> Funny thing happened. Can I, uh, could you put the winds back in the bag for me? And Aeolus says, if you're back here after all I did for you, you're on the wrong side of some god, and I'm not involved anymore. Adios, you're on your own. And uh, so they sadly uh, paddle away. This Odysseus, in fact, even talks about killing himself at this point, because everything he has done has gone wrong. And uh, he's he hasn't demonstrated much good judgment for the guy who thought up the Trojan horse and the guy who's famous as the wiliest of all the Greeks. He's not getting much. He's, he's not having a very good uh, trip home. At any rate, they sadly paddle away from the island of the Wid King and end up with the deadly Lestragonians. Two stops ago, they had the Cyclops who was eating his men left and right. Now they come to uh, the island of the Lestragonians and uh, Odysseus describes uh, uh, an almost invisible harbor and that you come and then suddenly the harbor opens up and you're in the harbor. If you have gone to, uh, you know, to the island of Corsica, um, the southern tip of Corsica has a harbor that exactly meets that description. And so everyone agrees that the southern tip of Corsica is where you go to see the Lestragonians. And if you can see from this picture, you see these cliffs, these staggeringly beautiful cliffs. It's, it's wonderful. The, the slide on the right is a uh, is the town in there that you can walk around in. And it's, uh, it's kind of crazy. It's beautiful. If, if you've ever traveled in the Mediterranean, those towns are wonderful. And um, so uh, Odysseus, when they come to this, this perfect harbor, all of his men, uh, all of his ships sail right in. But Odysseus is like, you know, when we went into the Cyclops cave and there was only one way out, Cyclops put a boulder in front of that, and we were in big trouble. I think I'm going to park my boat here on the outside of the harbor. And the men all, you know, the other ships all park inside the harbor. And Odysseus describes meeting uh, a, a, a giant, the daughter of a giant. And he says, well, you know, well, where's the where's the chief of your people, please? We'd like to meet them. And um, 
the girl doesn't say anything. She just points towards where the where where her parents are. And to me, that's like a scene from a horror movie, the, the creepy girl who just stares and lifts her arm and points. Well, at any rate, uh, a couple men go looking for them. The uh, the giants who live on the island grab them up and eat them and then run towards the harbor and start spearing the men of Odysseus's boats like fish. It's a, it's a disgrace. They kill virtually everyone. And Odysseus, the leader of men, the, the, the great hero of the Odyssey, addresses this attack by saying, remember Monty Python and the Holy Grail? Odysseus is like, run away, run away. And they run to their other boat, which is outside of the harbor, and they jump in and they paddle away. Odysseus's fleet is now down from a dozen boats to a single boat. It's just he's got one boat left. And everything, what has Odysseus done that is of any value at all to his men? All he's done is get like 11 twelfths of them killed so far. Um, and so then we move on from the Lestragonians on the island of Crete to uh, we're looking for Circe and we want to go on a journey to the underworld. Circe people are familiar with, but a funny thing we don't hear much about the journey to the underworld, and it turns out to be, in my opinion, the crux of the entire Odyssey. At any rate, uh, down down to a single ship, uh, they find uh, themselves on the island of the witch Circe, which is connected to Monte Cerceo, uh, a peninsula south of Rome that people think was an island up to about you know maybe a thousand years ago, and um, or maybe even a couple thousand years ago. At any rate. Um, Monte Cerceo, the, the, the mount of, you know, the, the hill of, of Circe, um, there's, a, stat, there's a, a museum down there where they have all kinds of statues from the Odyssey uh, that were in a cave that uh, one of the old Roman emperors had. And uh, it was, it's a, you know, there was a statue of the Cyclops and Odysseus killing the Cyclops. There are all these different statues, but there is a statue of Circe herself and the little pigs around there. Because as you probably recall, the story of Circe is that um, a couple of Odysseus's men, they, they, they beach on this island and a couple of his men go to see what's going on. And uh, one of them walks up and meets this beautiful witch who's sitting there and weaving. And uh, she says, here, have something to drink. And he has something to drink and she hits him with her magic wand and bang, he's a, he's a pig. Um, the other uh, soldier runs, runs back to Odysseus and says, oh my God, what's going on? He's turning us into pigs. And Odysseus says, all right, I've about had it. And he climbs up a uh, hill to go see what's going on. While he's climbing up, Mercury comes by uh, and says, hey, uh, which lives here, don't, uh, don't drink what she gives you and uh, don't, uh, don't let her turn you into a pig. Uh, if you drink this potion that I give you, if you eat this, 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 uh, if you eat this, uh, this, uh, there's a kind of food I can give you called moly um, and it will uh, prevent her magic from working on you. Odysseus eats that. Circe tries to turn him into a pig. Won't. It, it doesn't work. She throws herself at his mercy, and he says, "Turn my my men back into my men, and uh, uh, promise that you will not hurt us." And then they live there for about a year with Odysseus sleeping with Circe and the men hanging around and feasting. Finally, the men say, "We're tired of this. Let's get out of here." Odysseus says. All right, Cersei, we got to go. And she's, she gives him directions. She gives him directions. And she says, here's what you need to do. Um, the first thing you need to, do, need to do is go to the land of the dead and uh, consult uh, the seer Tiresias, who is inconveniently dead. So you have to go to the land of the dead to see him. So Odysseus and his men do that. Um, I knew what I wanted to do after just south of Rome, having gone to this uh, one-time island for the, uh, for the Isle of Circe, I wanted to go to uh, the uh, 
there's a beautiful church of the Capuchin monks in Rome where they use the bones of the uh, dead Capuchins as uh, decorations. And it's an incredibly powerful place. I have been there before. It was one of the most incredible places I've ever been to. And when I got there, uh, it was closed for renovations. And I did everything I could to talk my way in, but I couldn't. And so I ended up, of course, they also have uh, catacombs in uh, Rome. It's like the bones capital of the world. So I went uh, to the uh, catacombs and had a wonderful experience with some people I met there and you know, saw lots of dead people. And uh, Tiresias, the seer, tells Odysseus he has to sail by the island uh, of the uh, sirens. And uh, uh, he also tells him he's going to go see, have to go between uh, the, the Scylla and Charybdis, the famous monster Scylla and Charybdis. Uh, Scylla is a monster with six heads who will, will eat you as you go by, and Charybdis is a whirlpool on the other side of a, of a channel. And uh, he explains to Odysseus that you have to go by Scylla, who will eat six of your men, but it won't drown your whole ship. Um, and uh, he tells him how to go by the island of the sirens too. So island of the sirens, everyone agrees, are the Legali Islands uh, uh, off the coast of Naples. And um, so I went down there and I rented a boat and uh, a guy took me, a little motorboat, it took me out to see these islands. And it was just, just delightful. Now Odysseus, what he does to hear the, you know, everyone says, don't listen to the sirens. They are going to lure you to your doom. And uh, interestingly, we all think of the sirens as these beautiful women. Not so much. The In, in Odysseus's day, the sirens were uh, creatures with the bodies of birds and the heads of women. And they urge, they tell Odysseus that if he comes to listen to them, they can tell him secrets and they can tell him uh, information on how to get home and what's going on in the rest of the world. Odysseus wants to hear that. So what he famously does is stops the ears of his men with wax so they can't hear and he has them tie him to the mast so that they, no matter what he tells them to do, they won't hear him. And so they, they go past the islands of the sirens and the sirens are telling him all of this information. And Odysseus is like, oh, stop, stop. We have to go to this island. They have so much to tell me. And of course, his men can't hear. So that's uh, the famous call that uh, an Odysseus uh, bargain. Uh, they sometimes now, uh, uh, mental health professionals make what they call an Odysseus bargain with people who are not always in their right minds. They, When they're doing better, they have them discuss how we will treat you when you're not mentally well. And they call those uh, Ulysses bargains or Odysseus bargains. So that's an interesting thing. It's, it's a, clever, a clever thing. Then past uh, the sirens, they go to Scylla and Charybdis. And of course, between the toe of the boot of Italy and the uh, island of Sicily is this famously narrow channel. And uh, everybody agrees that when <clears throat> Homer talks about Scylla and Charybdis. They're talking about that narrow channel. And it actually is a complicated place to row your boat between because the, the tides are very uncertain because of the narrowness of the channel and all of this kind of stuff. So I actually uh, rented a kayak and paddled my way between Scylla and Charybdis. And I had a really great time doing that and talked to uh, to some really cool people there. And uh, if you see on your left, that's just a, a bridge, uh, a very attractive bridge on the side of the uh, the Italy side um, and, uh, you know, the boot of Italy side. And then on the right, you see a, 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 a statue of Poseidon, who of course is the god who's angry at Odysseus and is uh, getting in his way all the time. And, uh, but, uh, at the base of that statue on the left is uh, Scylla and on the right is Charybdis and note gaping maw. That's the, uh, that's the whirlpool that is going to suck you down. And um, the funny thing about Scylla and Charybdis is I always tell people this is the most perfect uh, description of reality that I've ever seen. Odysseus does steer his men 
between Scylla and Charybdis. He chooses Scylla. Six of his men are killed. He doesn't tell them that it's coming because he knows they won't row, but he makes the horrible bargain. He says, I'll lose six of my men, but the other boat full of them will live and we won't have to risk the whole boat through Charybdis. And they do that and it's wonderful. But then because of what happens uh, subsequently, they end up going he ends up back in the whirlpool anyway. And if anything describes the world I under, as I understand it, that's what it is. You make this horrible decision. You make a horrible sacrifice. You do the right thing and save people. And then something else stupid happens and you end up with the negative consequences anyway. That's the world I live in. Speaking of negative consequences, the cattle of the sun god. Odysseus is told you can land on this by Tiresias in, uh, in hell. He's told, you can land, you, whatever you do, do not eat the cattle of the sun god. No matter what else you do, don't eat the cattle of the sun god. If you do, it's going to be awful. You're going to, everybody's going to die. And if you make it home, you're going to make it late and under someone else's power. It's not going to work for you. Well, they land, you know, so here's the, the island of the sun god. And uh, his men are like, let's, that was terrible, Sil and Charybdis, let's stop there. And he's like, no, 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 we can't do that. They talk him into it, they stop. Um, he goes up to uh, take a walk and his men say, we're hungry, let's have a bite of cattle. He comes down and they're eating the cattle and he knows what's gonna happen. Uh, they get in their boat, they leave instantly, uh, bolt of lightning sinks the ship and if you've seen pictures of Odysseus clinging to a raft and floating around that's what happens at this point Odysseus is floating on a raft and he's off forever the uh the little uh, town of Terramina also in western Sicily has a statue of a minotaur and uh the city's symbol uh people associate it with cattle and so people tend to associate that with uh the cattle of the sun god um then Odysseus ends up on the island of the nymph Calypso. Uh, he stays there for seven years, uh, having sex with the uh, with the nymph Calypso. Nice work if you can get it. Um, and uh, everyone has agreed that the island, uh, that one of the islands, uh, the island of Gozo in the Maltese archipelago, is where. Uh, Calypso lived. They even have like signs, Calypso's cave this way. So I was able to go and visit Calypso's cave in Malta. Malta is a wonderful place. I recommend that you visit it. And when I was sitting around in the uh, cave, I met a, a trio, a, a pilot and two flight attendants uh, from a Emirates air crew. And we sat and read the Odyssey together and then ran around for a day or two on, uh, on Gozo. And uh, that was very delightful. And uh, then uh, finally, uh, when we meet Odysseus, he is sitting and crying because he wants to go home. That's where that's the first glimpse we have of Odysseus in the Odyssey is on the island of Malta, on Calypso's island, crying. And I think that's a very important thing to remember. This is a book about a middle-aged man. He's had it, he's done, he misses his wife, he misses his son, and he's weeping. And all of us who are in middle age or older recognize that weeping is truly the uh, the emotion of middle age. At any rate, so he leaves, she helps him, she gives him a boat, and he makes his way towards home again. And uh, Odysseus makes his way to uh, the uh, the island of the Phaeacians, who are the greatest sailors in uh, in the world, and uh, he crash lands there because further trouble with Poseidon, but he does make it in there, um, and the Phaeacians feast him and ask him to tell the story of his travels, which he does, and those are the four chapters in the Odyssey of uh, that we all remember of the Cyclops and the Sirens, and um, the Phaeacians then, because they're magical sailors, take Odysseus home. And uh, because Poseidon is so angry, he uh, supposedly turns one of their ships, when they return home, he turns their ships to stone. And um, on uh, the island of Corfu, uh, just north of Ithaca, there is a harbor where there's a, there's a stone that looks like a ship. 
And uh, so people say that's the island of, uh, of the Phaeacians and uh, that's where the, the frozen ship is. Then finally, Ithaca. I made it to Ithaca uh, and you see there are, that's the uh, harbor in the upper left. That's the actual harbor uh, of uh, Vati in, uh, uh, in Ithaca. And uh, uh, it's a wonderful little, uh, little place to visit. It's very peaceful. I spent a lot of time on the beach there all by myself. Um, they of course have lots of Odyssey souvenirs. I'll show you them when we stop my screen share. And um, then uh, you can walk around and see various places that may or may not be connected to the, uh, the scenes in the Odyssey. Down there on the lower left is something that they call the, uh, the, the castle of the Odyssey, the, cap, the castle of Odysseus. Um, and of course, Selfie, it's the selfie capital of the world probably. And then uh, the other things that you do, if you're gonna be in the Mediterranean, is uh, up there on the left, you know, uh, Odysseus's son, uh, Telemachus, goes on a journey that occupies the first four books of the Odyssey, and he visits uh, he, he visits Menelaus and Helen, who are kind of living this creepy life where they like have forgotten that they that they started the Trojan War, um, and uh, he visits them, and then uh, in the bottom left you'll see. Uh, and so that uh, on the top upper left, that's outside of Sparta, uh, where of course Helen and Menelaus are from, and that's a, a memorial to them outside of Sparta. I went up there, um, and then uh, down uh, in the lower left is Pylos, uh, where uh, Telemachus visits Nestor, the famously long-winded Nestor, and uh, telling telling him boring stories. And then to the right. Uh, upper right, you just see a cool spot in Athens that I liked, and lower right, it's the Acropolis. I mean, come on, it's Athens. And so there's some uh, pictures of me uh, at the Acropolis, and uh, which is the last thing you're going to do when you go to Greece. You're not going to leave without seeing the Acropolis. And that is the entire uh, journey of Odysseus and my journey. And um, let me... Uh, stop my screen share now and uh now so and the two things i'll show you here is uh this is odysseus a little alabaster odysseus that i got when i went to uh ithaca which of course you can imagine how treasured it was to have taken that entire journey and come home and here's my first souvenir uh if you go to troy you're gonna come home with a wooden horse so that is my journey. And let's talk. If you have questions, please ask them and uh, I will answer them. I've got a couple. Uh, first first off, I want to tell you how much I appreciate your reference to uh, Monty Python's Holy Grail, right. which also includes a scene with a Trojan rabbit. Right, um, right, right. <laughs> so good. So just a couple of things that came up for me. First, when you first started talking, you were talking about Ulysses, um, James Joyce's book. and. Um, I'm wondering how can a book that requires handholding to understand it um, be revered as such a classic? Well, that's a great question. And as a writer, I, I can love the book, but in a way I cannot revere it because your, your goal when you write a book is for people to read it. And I can tell you, I'm a pretty good reader. You know, and I've written my share of books, many more than my share, some people would say. Um, but if I couldn't read that book, it means you may have aimed too high. But of course, Joyce, his goal was to have people trying to puzzle out its secrets for centuries. Clearly, he achieved his goal. And it is fun in a sort of puzzle solving way. And uh, the one time, that I can say I actually just enjoyed, and I felt like I was engaged in just the reading of the actual book. I can discuss it with you because you guys live in a civilized state and marijuana is legal there, um, was when <laughs> I was reading one of the chapters, you know, we would do a chapter at a time and I just couldn't get anywhere with the book. I, and I enjoyed, all, you know, I would force myself to read each chapter, but one chapter I just smoked a little pot and I was reading it and I was like, 
I, I like got it. I was engaged with the book. So maybe Joyce was on drugs. I don't know. But it's a great question. And I don't in any way say you shouldn't write books that require this kind of insane engagement to, to read them. They're not the kind of books I like to read. And they're certainly not the kind of books I would ever want to write. But people who, you know, people love that kind of stuff. Look, people love the English patient. Okay, to me, the English patient is a fever dream. I don't understand it at all, but people love it. That's okay. I read Gravity's Rainbow. I knocked myself out to read Gravity's Rainbow. Same thing. There were parts of that that I really kind of got, but mostly I was just reading words. So I don't right. do that anymore. If I can't get, get it, I'll go on to the next book. Yeah, thank you. Uh, a question from Penelope. Um, she says, you just gave a great whirlwind trip through Adventures of Odysseus, but in your book, you share so many reflections of how the journey impacted you. So in a nutshell, how were you impacted by this journey and how, how have you changed? Wow, um, what a great question. And uh, thank you for that. Um, yes, the, uh, <clears throat> if, uh, if you read reviews of the book, people gener generally like it. It was very, very well reviewed in the, uh, in, in the press. And, and most people who read it seem to like it. People who don't like it tend to complain that I'm reaching for some of my connections, you know, and various things. Um, the funny thing is like, uh, we're talking about, I was talking about running around with that, that group of flight attendants. Um, the funny thing was, um, you know, this is all about Odysseus living on this island for seven years, having sex with this goddess. And now here's me running around, uh, my wife's at home gestating. She's the size of a Macy's Thanksgiving Day parade balloon. And I'm out gallivanting in the, in the Mediterranean. And here I meet this pilot, this delightful pilot, and these two delightful young women and we're having dinner together and of course it's just flirtation central and we're having this wonderful conversation and you know all these double entendres and we're all really enjoying ourselves and then at one point i said to the pilot you know um an airplane is a funny way of travel because when you're waiting to get on all you want to do is get on get on the airplane and the minute you're on the airplane all you are living for is getting off that stinking airplane. And he laughed and he said, oh, that's so funny. It's like illicit sex, where when you're not having it, oh boy, do you want it? But the minute you're having it, you're like, oh, get me out of this. And the energy level of our table went, and it was wonderful. It was hilarious. And it was just delicious. And it was like, he spoke, truth and reason and it was like the moment had passed nobody was getting into any mischief and he and i sat in front of my hotel for an hour in the car talking about various things and it was one of the great conversations of my life and what i would say i learned from that moment is that everybody's like well i'm not the type everybody's the type everybody's capable of it if you're not capable of it of what meaning is it that you don't run around on your spouse right it's no it's not hard if it's not possible it's not hard not to do so it's the sacrifice is when you don't and so in Odysseus's case yes finally after eight years of sleep or seven years of sleeping with the goddess he was like all right gosh look at the time gotta go but um the sense that he really, that he's like, let me out of here. And she's like, I could turn you into a God. You could live forever with me. And he's like, I want to go home and die with my wife. Wow. This is meaningful. Um, so finding in yourself all of the mistakes that Odysseus has made and the, the, the hope that you can do some of the, the, the graceful things he did, that was every minute had meaning for me now and i'll tell you another thing um if you've read the book you know the about this the the journey to hell and as i mentioned in another trip i had been to the the capuchin uh church and been into these little crypts which were one of the most moving experiences of my life and when i was in there i came out and had this conversation with one of the monks who was running the gift shop and uh he didn't really speak much English and I didn't really speak much Italian, but we were doing our best to talk about things. And 
you know, I talked about, and he, he managed to explain to me that I had stayed for like an hour, an hour and a half, and that usually people were in for 20 minutes, you know, a mi 10, 15 minutes, they take a couple pictures, he tells them you're not allowed to take pictures, and then they leave. But I stayed because it was so powerful. The skeletons, they are holding signs saying, as I, as you are now, I once was, as I am now, you soon will be. And it's just like, think about it, bub. You're dead a long time. Keep that in mind. And I was so moved by that. And we really talked about that and had this, like we connected. And then I bought a few postcards and he gave me more postcards than I had bought. And I said, oh, no, no, this one isn't. And he, he kept saying, no, no. And finally he managed, he, you know, uh, oh, it's right here. It's right here. I still have it on my wall. It's the picture of God touching Adam from the Sistine Chapel ceiling. And he finally said, he went like this. <laughs> he, made, he expressed, I'm giving to you a gift here. And in this place, reminding you of death, he's giving me this gift of the touch of God. And I wept. This was one of the most powerful moments of my life. And so you can imagine how much I wanted to go back there. And of course, when it's closed, I'm like, oh my God. But once again, your job on this planet is to face the disappointment and the complexity and the things being different than you want. And so finding a way to say like, no, okay, wait, I'll, I'll find a different place of the dead. And when I walked, I met a friend, as you always do when you're traveling, and when we walked into the catacombs, the smell, I want you to go to the catacombs someday, because of course, once you're underground, it's cool, it's going to be 57 degrees, that's how it is once you're underground, and the smell, the dust, and the ancientness and you're just like it didn't smell like death it smelled like eternity and it smelled like peace and we walked in there and this young woman Asli just turned to me and she said the smell and it was just this powerful moment of just like Odysseus just like all this it's not for nothing that everybody taking your Joseph Campbell journey has to go to hell and back right it's uh Buffy the Vampire Slayer did it, and, you know, so did Jesus. Everybody does it. It's how we say, I am changed. And that's that every time I've done it, whether it was with the Capuchins or whether it was with, you know, Osley going down to the catacombs. And in fact, I went down a couple more times. I had done everything I needed to, but I was like, I just need to keep doing this because that sense of peacefulness of rest and you know Odysseus famously is just done he's like I don't want to go anywhere else I don't want to do anything else and as I say in the book I left home looking for that sense of doneness and you know with my I got started late in having children but here I'm on my mid-40s I can have one last big giant adventure and then I can feel done regrettably, I just appear to be uh, somebody who's never done. And so I'm always like, okay, where can I go next? But um, it was a great, that sense of doneness, yearning for doneness. I really got that experience from, from that. Uh, so, so I was changed by that, I think. Does, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thank you. That was, that was great. So I, um, you, you and I were chatting earlier about um, this the, the, the books that have been coming out over the years that look at um, the Odyssey sort of from other people's perspectives, other characters that are just get a brief mention, including um, Circe by Madeline Miller, which just came out this last year, and also the Penelope ad by Joyce Carol Oates. And I, I'm just wondering if you are intrigued by this idea of looking at a classic um, whether, you know, looking at a classic from different perspectives and why those books, those kinds of books are important, or maybe you don't think they're important or interesting. I, I love them. I consume them. The Penelope ad. Um, oh, so good. It was so right. good. Was it by Joyce Carol Oates or was it the one, there was one, there was one called the Penelope ad that came out by uh, 
Who was it who wrote the? Oh, Margaret Atwood. Right. Margaret Atwood. Right. Are we talking um, about two different books, or is that what we're talking? No, I got it wrong. So yeah, it's okay. Penelope right. Ad by um, Margaret Atwood, which was crazy. read, so read good. the Penelope ad. It is so incredibly good. Um, and then there are uh, there are are versions of uh, the Odyssey written in sort of vernacular as novels that that are in the in the the bibliography of my book. Um, you've got lists and lists of them, and I love them. They're wonderful because. What they say is that, why has this story lasted so long? As I say in the book, it has good bones. It has lasted so long because it is addressing all of the things that we face, all of our conflicts as people. The difficulty of, do you want to have great adventures or do you want to be home with your kids? It turns out you can't do both. And so if you're going to have a great, satisfying career, it means you're going to give up some of the things you might have with your kids. If you're going to really be that present parent who is in their lives and who loves them and who is engaged and who doesn't lose track of them periodically and suddenly say like, oh my God, my kid is getting a D in whatever. And I was asleep at the switch because I was looking at something else. You can't do both of those things. If you're going to be really engaged in one thing, you're going to have to let go of something else. Everything has a price. Everything is a trade-off. And that's, that's a powerful message. And it's a true message. And one of the things that, you know, and I love that about Scylla and Charybdis, as I said, you know, Odysseus makes this horrible choice. He makes this most difficult trade-off. His men are eaten alive by a monster calling his name at the as they're being chewed up Odysseus save us and he's has to stand there and watch them die saying I made the decision that killed you but it saved his other 70 men so he that's difficult and then to end up that the men that he saved make this stupid decision and eat the cattle of the sun and that gets Odysseus back in the whirlpool anyway oi you know but doesn't that sound like the world you live in that sounds like the world I live in and uh so it's just like wow you know that's why I love every new take on an old book and uh, a friend of mine when uh has anybody read the wind done gone here the take uh, on uh, Gone with the Wind from the slave's perspective. And uh, there was a big uh, court case in it because uh, the estate of uh, the author of Gone with the Wind was like, you can't take our characters and do this. And I was like, for shame. This is exactly what could be better than the characters you created causing other creative people to want to engage with them and make make more creative work out of them that's that's thrilling to me and I just love that so yeah I think the first book that I read that did this uh was Ahab's wife right you know, from Moby Dick where she gets one line in Moby Dick she doesn't right. even have a name right and that right. The author creates this whole wonderful narrative from her perspective. I, I think it is so creative, and and to your point, it gives a di- it gives new life um, to a treasured classic. So right. I well, I'm intrigued by it. Well, and in that one, it takes you know, as you say, one line. There are virtually no women in Moby Dick. It's it's a it's a classic. It's a wonderful book. It's one of my favorite books. I'm I've only read it once, and I'm saving it to read again because it's so good. I don't want to have a second read of it before I've had enough time to really wait for it. But there's so much to look at in that book, and to take it from a woman's perspective and say, women are erased from this book. Now, okay, it's a good book about men and their obsessions and, you know, and their sexuality and all of these crazy things going on. Let's take looking at these things that men do from a woman, from a woman's perspective. And let's think about that, you know, from women who, for much of our culture's history, have been left on the sidelines and have been erased. Let's look at it from that perspective. That's brilliant and wonderful. And I love that. So, 
you know, yeah. so no, I eat things like that up. I love, you know, I'm waiting for a, a take on Huck Vin from the, you know. Oh, there, there was one. I'll send you the suggestion. It was written oh. from um, the father's point of view. Oh, from Pap's point of view. Oh, I would love to read that. Send it to me, please. It's do called, that. I think it's called Finn. It's just called Finn. It's dark. Yeah. It's dark, but good. Well, okay. So <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to give just a couple more quite, uh, minutes in case every, anybody else has a question. But um, I, we always like to end um, events with writers. Are you working on anything currently? Or well, what, are you, right, what are you doing? Right now, for the first time in a long time, I have like a job job, which is, as you said, I'm the senior writer at uh, Duke Magazine. And that's a great job. And I do a lot of writing. But, you know, between that and having children who have still not grown up uh, inexplicably, um, <laughs> Uh, that'll keep me busy, but I do write um, essays and articles and stuff. I'm working on some essays that I've been wanting to write for a long time. And I suddenly realized that um, like I had a book come out uh, a couple years ago in, in 2019, a, a book, another journey book where I retraced the journey of a, of a, a guy named John Lawson, an explorer who in 1700 went walking through the Carolinas and, uh, I had finished the traveling and some some of the writing of that book before I got my current job and then was working a job and writing a book at the same time, contraindicated, not recommended. And um, so, uh, so I've just been breathing since then and supporting that book. And now it's time to uh, work on whatever's next. And like I said, I'm working on a series of essays that I'm really excited to be writing because a funny thing for a guy who spent as much time in his life as a journalist as I have, I never set out to be a journalist. I set out to be a writer. I was like, and wanted to be an essayist. And uh, um, I found out fairly early on that the way you get paid to write is to do journalism. And uh, so that's what I've done. And uh, briefly uh, tricked people in New York into thinking that they should give me big bags of money to write books. But uh, books that sell the way my books sell, uh, people in New York stop giving you big bags of money fairly quickly. And uh, <laughs> so uh, now I'm uh, doing, now Now I'm living in my my natural ecosystem. And, uh, but uh, it's a good, it's a good time. Um, so I just want to thank you, Scott, for sharing today. It was really an exceptional conversation and appreciate it. So for those of you um, who want to investigate Scott's work, No Man's Land, One Man's Odyssey through the Odyssey, and then also A Delicious Country, Rediscovering the Carolinas Along the Route of John Lawson's 1700 Expedition. So um, please avail yourself of those wonderful books. And I will say my website is just my name, scotthewler.com. And if you want to talk to me about something, Go to the email, go to the connect page and click on the email link. And that will go right into a little computer that I carry around in my pocket. So if you have something you need me to know, you can tell me and I'd love yeah. to. So. Yeah. Thank you for spending the time. I'm going to end the webinar. And it's it's always kind of sad for me because I end the webinar and then I don't get to say goodbye. And thank you. Well, we'll keep in touch. I've enjoyed talking with you. So yeah. send me an email. Okay. okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye.